welcome to section 3, Array and Slices. In this section, we're going to be talking about how to declare and use arrays in lecture 1. In the next lecture, we're going to look at how to use arrays and function. That is, how to pass arrays to function and how to return arrays from function and the implication of doing so. Then we're going to talk about slices. Slices are very much like arrays and we can see how we're going to create slices from arrays and these the additional capabilities that slices give you especially when we get to slices and function which is the how do you pass slices to function how do you return slices from function the implication of doing that we're going to get into something i call cesc slices at runtime and all that is is a mouthful to say that we're going to look at how to create slices expand slices shrink slices and copy slices at runtime runtime simply means when your program is running and finally we're going to wrap up and that is going to be tying up any loose end anything that we left on the floor on purpose while we went through, you know, section one through five, and we're gonna pick up those things in the wrap up section. And then of course, look at the two labs that you're gonna have for this section. So with that said, let's jump in and take a look at what arrays are. It's about declaring and using arrays. So if you're new to arrays, we should set the landscape of what we plan to learn in this lecture. So in this lecture, we wanna understand what is an array. We wanna understand how to declare an array and how to store and retrieve values from an array. It wouldn't be any too useful if we can only put values in an array and couldn't get it out, or if all we can do is retrieve values, because then we wouldn't be able to put what we want into an array. We'll then look at how you calculate the length of an array. That can be useful if you do not know the length already. It'd be good to know what is the length of an array. And some of this might not make sense to you why we might be thinking of a length of an array right now, but you will see in a minute. And we'll talk about iterating of an array again, which might not make sense to you, but iteration simply means just visiting every element of an array. And if you've never been exposed to array, that still doesn't make any sense, but I wanna set the landscape, give you an idea of what we're gonna cover before we talk about it. Let's say I had some numbers. And so I have this number 12, and it doesn't really matter what it represents. It could be test score, it could be the number of some particular item in my inventory, and I had 53 to represent yet another number. Again, it could be test scores, it doesn't matter. But I have these numbers, and I have 10 of them. Now, without arrays, if I told you to store these number in your program, you'd have to do is say, these are my values I'm interested in, and I'll have to create a variable to store the first number. And let's say we call that variable x0. And maybe I call it x0 because I like counting from zero. Let's say that for now. And I call the next variable x1, and that stores the value 53. And x2, and it stores the values 86 and x3 store the value 94 and so on. Now I have 10 variables, each with different names. Even though the names are very similar, they have different names because they are storing values for different items, right? Whatever those numbers represent. Well, those are my variables. I have 10 of them. If I wanted to calculate the sum, for example, just a simple thing, that is gonna look like x0, the variable representing the first value, plus x1, plus, of course, x2, plus x3 and the remaining variables. And as you can see, this is sort of cumbersome. And what if I had a hundred or thousand? Let's say these numbers represent record keeping for the temperature or something over a few years. And I wanted to see what is the average temperature over the past 10 years. And that would be 10 years times 365 day about for per year. And so we're talking about thousands of data points and we couldn't possibly use something like an individual variable for each value. And this already comes with just 10. You can imagine twice as many, 20, much less, thousands of them. And so life without an array in that sort of situation is painful to say the least. Here we're gonna try and get an illustration of what an array can give you. And logically, you might wanna think of an array. So we still have our values and the corresponding variables from the world without arrays, because we wanna keep that to compare it with a world with arrays. We still have these values, but we want to treat them as one entity. We want to think of some way, if you can think of it as if you had a container that you could put all the numbers in so that you can deal with it as one entity. A very silly way of thinking about it is if I had some balls on the ground and I need to move them from one room to another room, I can certainly take one ball at a time, but it might be better if I just have a bag or a box, throw all the balls in there, and then just take the box to the next room. And now I'm taking the balls with me. So it's sort of like that, right? We want a, a way to encapsulate and think of the set of numbers as an entity by itself. And if we do that, we can call this an array. 
and we can give a name to our array. So in this case, we're going to call our array nums. Just as a name, we can use anything else. We can start thinking about how do you get to each element or each value in that array. You can see the very first element in that array, we're going to say it's at location zero. And the next one is at location one, the next one is at location two, next at location three, and so on have this one name that we can use to represent all our numbers, we can still pick out individual elements out of that collection, right? So an array is a collection. You might hear people say it's a container. All those things are still valid, right? Now you see that it's important for us to be able to say, well, if someone gives me an array, how do I know how many elements or how many values are in that array? And that's where the length comes in. And Go gives you a built-in function called length. You don't have to import any package or anything to use it. And you can just simply say length of whatever the name of that array. It's a function. And it returns the value. And in this case, we have a 10 element array. Another analogy, the way I like to think of it, and I'd like you to consider thinking about arrays, is imagine that you had a mailbox. And this type of mailbox you'd find in like an apartment building or something like that. And you had this mailbox. And each little box or storage unit for a customer or apartment owner would get a number. And so you would just assign a number to each one of these boxes. Think of an array like that is the whole big thing is one way of treating everything. But then you can also talk about the individual storage unit, which are all alike. All of the little boxes store values of the same type. None of the boxes are bigger than any other box and so on. Keep that analogy in mind. Now in mind of Visual Studio Code, and of course, the section three, lecture one, declaring and using arrays. Now, let's revisit how we create a variable. So far, we've learned that if you want to create a variable, you simply use the var keyword and identifier, and then you say the type. So you have something like this. That says that x is an int. You literally read it that way, var x is an int. We also know that how you can create a variable by initializing it with a value and let go derive the type. So we can do that. Okay. So that now says that var y is equal to the value five, and then go is going to infer the type as int. What is an array? An array is a special type of variable that holds multiple values of the same type. This is going to make sense with a very contrived example. So before I get into the example, let's call this the world before arrays. Now, here's a contrived example. Imagine that I have five items and I want to keep track of the prices because I want to do some calculation. I want to get a total. I want to get an average price and so on. Now, you might say, well, five items, I can just look at it and pretty much tell. But we're setting up this example to demonstrate the principle. So how might I do that if I don't know to use arrays? So there are my prices for my five item and I've numbered them from zero. But now I want to do some calculations. So first, let's um, print out all my prices and then Let's do some calculation with it. Well, let's review our program so far. Nothing terribly fancy. I have my five prices. I print them out. Then I do an addition, a summation of the prices into this total variable. I calculate the average price. And that is, of course, the total divided by the number of items that I have. And of course, I print those out. So let's run our program now. And as we expect, those are our values. They're space separated and the total price. I don't like my average price and I do not like my total price either, how it's formatted. They do not look like prices actually. We know to fix that by introducing a type that we can then attach a method to. So let's do that. And notice introducing a type doesn't have anything to do with an array. I just want my printout for my prices to actually look like prices. I have my type, a new type I call float64. I should change all my prices here, which are actually float64 values. I should change those now to currency type. Now we have that prices are currency. And if I rerun my program after that simple change, and now everything looks like price and it's formatted properly. Okay, great. So I'm happy with that. But still, this doesn't tell us anything but arrays, except for this really inconvenience that I have here that I have to call my variable like price zero, price one, price two. And if I were to add another price, because I decided that oh, I have a sixth item, now I have to say price five, currency, and whatever value I want to use. Uh, let's just use some value here. And if I want my calculations to come out correctly, I must add that price five to total. 
and now when it comes to the average price i must divide by not five but six now and i still want to print that out too so i have to update a few places and of course things are going to work now because i adjusted my program to take account for the sixth item notice i said sixth item because we're counting from zero okay so how does an array help us? Now this is the world before arrays. So let's see about how do we declare an array. So to declare an array is very simple. We still use var. The array we want to create is called prices. So that still looks the same. And our prices are going to be also currency type. So how do we say this is an array? We use square brackets and a number. And in this case, what I'm saying is prices is an array. When you see the square bracket, if you were keep reading from left to right, var prices, variable prices is an array. When you see the square brackets, an array of six element, each element being of type currency. And that's the thing with an array. It can contain a number of items of or values of the same type. You're not allowed to mix type. And that's because you specify the type here. So every element or each value must be of this type. And we can hold six values of type currency in this one variable. And so this give us the ability to manipulate a number of values using one variable. And let's see how we can do that. Well, first thing first I wanna do is print out this variable and see what it looks like, what is inside of it right now. And notice when I run my program, it shows a square bracket and it shows, oh, this is an array. It has number of values and they are each currency. Notice they have the zero value, which is the default value for anything that's not initialized of an integral value. And we know that currency's base value is, or base type is full. So it will have zero. Okay, so already we can see that oh, there's place for us to put our six prices. And so now all we need to figure out is how to store values in an array. And so let me go back and copy this and paste it below here. And so we don't need to create variables anymore, at least not now. So I'll remove this. And that is it. We have used the array name, which is prices, We've used square bracket again, and this is called indexing. So when you use square bracket with the array name, you're saying you're indexing into the array. Essentially, you want to access the element of that array, and the element we want to access is element zero. Now, this is important. Go is a language that's based off of C, C++, and so on. And like C and C++, it uses zero base indexing. Unlike C and C++, however, you cannot use negative number. So anything less than zero is invalid and your program will panic and crash. Not only that, Go has bounce checking. So which means that since our array is declared as having six elements or six places for storing currency, we can say from zero, one, which zero being the first one, can remember you cannot do negative number and it's zero base. So zero is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. If we try to access the sixth element, we'll get an error. And that is good because it means that oh, you cannot write programs that try to store things in memory location that wasn't allocated. This is a common bug in languages like C or C++. No, we don't have to worry about that because Go flags this as being illegal. Compile time error, okay? So this is not allowed, going out of bounds. Let's try and print out our array after we have initialized it and see how things look. And there we are, exact same thing as before. It looks just like this, except these are individual values that we printed out. Here we print out an array, puts the square bracket in front of it to let us know this is an array, and we still have all the same values. So already we see the convenience of being able to use an array. Now we can just use one variable to store a number of values instead of having to deal with a number of different variables. Now, if that was all there is to it, then we're already ahead being able to use a variable to access and store a number of values. But if you look at this, you can see that these numbers, we can use a variable here also to index into our array. So long as the value of the variable is valid, which means it's more than zero, 
and less than the maximum that you can store in the array. So if our array size is six, then the last index is one less than the length. Well, we can use a variable. So that means now that we can use a for loop. Let's see how we not only iterate, but also access the value for an array. So to access any value from an array, as you can imagine, it looks exactly like how you identify a location to store a value. If I copy and paste what we were doing before, I can write the same code. And now I'm using my array prices. I'm getting the first element of it. Now instead, notice when I put it on the left side and an equal sign, I mean store value into it. But without assigning anything to it, I'm retrieving the value. So I said, get the first value, get the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth, add those up and my result should be the same value as before. And as you can see, it is. What I said earlier is if you look at these values, you can see that they're increasing from zero to five. And we know about four loops, and we know that we can do a for loop that goes from zero to a value five, or the length of the array, one less than the length of the array. Let's write a for loop that would iterate over our array, or visit each element of our array. So what this does is it iterates, it goes from i equals zero, i less than six, i being less than six means it goes from zero to five, which is good. Now we use an i here to index into our prices array. So now that gets us each value, we assign it to price. But we can't just assign it to price, we have to add it to price. So we're gonna do a plus equal increment, which remember is the exact same thing as if we had said this, right? Those two things are the same. But of course, we already have a value in price, so we need to clear price before we use it here. The reason why we didn't have to do that here is because we're doing the summation on the right-hand side and just assigning the total value. But here, we're looping over our array and assigning each value each time around the loop, so we need to start off with price being zero. We can now bring this down, and the result should be the same. And it is we see that we have the convenience of using a for loop and it's much more compact than using this. Not only that, is if we grow the size of our array, the only thing we need to do is adjust this number here. And even that, there's something for this. Now, what about if we can get the size of the array without having to type it all the time? Here we're remembering it. Yes, we could store it in a constant and reuse the constant, but Go also give us a function that can give us the length of that array. It's called the length function. So let's copy and paste this code. And that's a built-in function. You don't need to import it from anywhere. We're getting this error. And the error here is saying invalid operation. We have length function return an integer, but here we have a currency. We cannot do any calculation, but we know to fix it by casting the integer to a currency value. Now everything is right in the world, and if we rerun our code, this still works. So this is exactly what we expect. We have seen how you can iterate over an array with a for loop using the length function, but it's still even more that Go gives you to make this even easier. Now we're gonna look at iterating over a array using the range function or the range operator actually. And notice I haven't changed much now. I've simply said range over this array and this built-in operator understands how to visit each element of this array and return the index. That's why I haven't changed any of the code. But just let's type in, I usually would use the plus equal operator instead of doing it this way. And again, we get the same result. Of course, now we've seen how oh, much easier it is. We don't even have to use the length function. But even when we had to use the length function, it was still much better than what we were doing before. And still, the fun doesn't end here. We can still do even more with for loop and the range operator. So in this example, what I'm going to do is the range operator could return one value. And in this case, when you do a range over an array, it returns the index of that array but it also can return two values. You can assign not only the index, but also the value. Now you might want to do this because if you want to print out what is the current index and the corresponding value, 
then you might want to get both index and value from the array. So what I'm doing here is I'm printing the prices variable and the index and then, well, string really. And I'm saying prices of this index is equals to a value. So that's why I is going to go here and V is going to go here. So that's the value. And now you can see what that looks like. In the previous lecture, in lecture 13 for section two, we said that one of the things you can do is use the blank identifier and that allow you to ignore a value when you have multiple assignment. For example, in this case, we can rewrite this loop and we can ignore the index because we do not want the index. Remember, if we don't want the value, we simply don't put it in and the range operator works just fine by returning just the index. But if we want the value, then we must specify both and say that we're gonna ignore the index. And since we're ignoring the index, well, we can simply do this. And of course, above here, since we were getting the value already, there's no point in us being explicit because we already have the value V here. So we can just shorten things that way. Not only is iterating over the array easy using the range operator, but also giving you the ability to grow our array wherever we need to initialize it and the rest of this code will work just the same. That works. So one last thing I want to show you before we finish up here in this lecture, and that is how you can initialize an array at the time when you create it. So if we go back here to the initialization of our array. So let's create another array we're going to call prices2. And this is how we did it the first time. And these are our values that we want to initialize the array with. Well, I want to assign the value. So I want to do something similar to something like that. So that is essentially what I wanted. But since this is an array, I must put something on the right side of the equal sign that would allow Go to be able to infer that this is an array of six elements. So the way we do this, if we put equal sign, we still say array six and currency, but now we want to initialize it at the time that we create it. You can remember it's going to be zero otherwise. All I need to do to get my array to be initialized at a time when I create it is enclose the values I want in parentheses and assign it to the array. Of course, I have to precede that array initialization with the type. So here I say I want a six element array of currency and I initialize it. Now, if I do not include six element, that's fine because this says it's a six element array. And even if I leave out some members, guess what? They're just going to be zero. I can call this, put 60 here, for example, and it will still work fine. But I just wanted to show you that you, it's not illegal for you to say that you have a larger array and only initialize it with a few values. And there you go. Take care. See you in the next lecture. Let's look at your exercise. So your exercise today is very simple. You're going to create a program which declares 10 to 20 elements. The second thing you'll do is initialize your array with some random values. So where are you going to get the random values? Well, you're going to get it from this input package that get random float. Once you initialize your array, you're going to do some calculation. You're going to calculate the total, max, min, and average for those numbers in your array and print it out, of course. And if you get stuck, just check the solution. Welcome to section three, array and slices. In this section, we're going to be talking about how to declare and use arrays in lecture one. In the next lecture, we're going to look at how to use arrays and function. That is how to pass arrays to function and how to return arrays from function and the implication of doing so. Then we're going to talk about slices. Slices are very much like arrays and we can see how we're going to create slices from arrays and these the additional capabilities that slices give you especially when we get to slices and function, which is be how do you pass slices to function? How do you return slices from function? The implication of doing that. We're going to get into something I call CESC slices at runtime. And all that is, is a mouthful to say that we're going to look at how to create slices, expand slices, shrink slices, and copy slices at runtime. Runtime simply means when your program is running. And finally, we're going to wrap up, and that is going to be tying up any loose end, anything that we left on the floor on purpose, while we went through, you know, section one through five, and we're going to pick up those things in the wrap up section. And then, of course, look at the two labs that you're going to have 
for this section. So with that said, let's jump in and take a look at what arrays are. It's about declaring and using arrays. So if you're new to arrays, we should set the landscape of what we plan to learn in this lecture. So in this lecture, we want to understand what is an array. We want to understand how to declare an array and how to store and retrieve values from an array. It wouldn't be any too useful if we can only put values in an array and couldn't get it out, or if all we can do is retrieve values, because then we wouldn't be able to put what we want into an array. We'll then look at how you calculate the length of an array. That can be useful if you do not know the length already. It'd be good to know what is the length of an array. And some of this might not make sense to you why we might be thinking of a length of an array right now, but you will see in a minute. And we'll talk about iterating of an array. Again, which might not make sense to you, but iteration simply means just visiting every element of an array. And if you've never been exposed to array, that still doesn't make any sense, but I want to set the landscape, give you an idea of what we're going to cover before we talk about it. Let's say I had some numbers. And so I have this number 12, and it doesn't really matter what it represents. It could be test score. It could be the number of some particular item in my inventory. And I had 53 to represent yet another number. Again, it could be test scores. It doesn't matter. But I have these numbers and I have 10 of them. Now, without arrays, if I told you to store these number in your program, what you'd have to do is say, these are my values I'm interested in, and I'll have to create a variable to store the first number. And let's say we call that variable x0. And maybe I call it x0 because I like counting from zero. Let's say that for now. And I call the next variable x1, and that stores the value 53. And x2, and it stores the value 86. And x3, store the value 94, and so on. Now I have 10 variables, each with different names. Even though the names are very similar, they have different names because they are storing values for different items, right? Whatever those numbers represent. Well, those are my variables. I have 10 of them. If I wanted to calculate the sum, for example, just a simple thing, that is going to look like x0, the variable representing the first value, plus x1, plus, of course, x2, plus x3, and the remaining variables. And as you can see, this is sort of cumbersome. And what if I had a hundred or a thousand? Let's say these numbers represent record keeping for the temperature or something over a few years. And I wanted to see what is the average temperature over the past 10 years. And that would be 10 years times 365 day about for per year. And so we're talking about thousands of data points and we couldn't possibly use something like an individual variable for each value. And this already cumbersome with just 10. You could imagine twice as many, 20, much less, thousands of them. And so life without an array in that sort of situation is painful to say the least. Here we're going to try and get an illustration of what an array can give you. Logically, you might want to think of an array. So we still have our values and the corresponding variables from the world without arrays because we want to keep that to compare it with a world with arrays. We still have these values, but we want to treat them as one entity. We want to think of some way, if you could think of it as if you had a container that you could put all the numbers in so that you can deal with it as one entity. A very silly way of thinking about it is if I had some balls on the ground and I need to move them from one room to another room, I can certainly take one ball at a time, but it might be better if I just have a bag or a box, throw all the balls in there, and then just take the box to the next room. And now I'm taking the balls with me. So it's sort of like that, right? We want a, a way to encapsulate and think of the set of numbers as an entity by itself. And if we do that, we can call this an array and we can give a name to our array. So in this case, we're going to call our array nums. Plus, as a name, we can use anything else. We can start thinking about how do you get to each element or each value in that array. You can see the very first element in that array, we're going to say it's at location zero. And the next one is at location one. The next one is at location two. The next is location three, and so on. We have this one name that we can use to represent all our numbers. We can still pick out individual elements out of that collection, right? So an array is a collection. You might hear people say it's a container. All those things are still valid, right? Now you see that it's important for us to be able to say, well, if someone gives me an array, how do I know how many elements or how many values are in that array? And that's where the length comes in. And Go gives you a built-in function called length. You don't have to import any package or anything to use it. And you can just simply say length of whatever the name of that array. It's a function. And it returns the value. And in this case, we have a 10-element array. Another analogy, the way I like to think of it, and I'd like 
you to consider thinking about Aries is imagine that you had a mailbox and these type of mailbox you find in like an apartment building or something like that and you had this mailbox and each little box or storage unit for a customer or apartment owner would get a number and so you would just assign a number to each one of these boxes think of an area like that is the whole big thing is one way of treating everything but then you can also talk about the individual storage unit which are all alike all of the little boxes store values of the same type none of the boxes are bigger than any other box and so on keep that analogy in mind all right my video you studio code and of course the section three lecture one declaring and using arrays now let's revisit how we create a variable so far we've learned that if you want to create a variable you simply use the var keyword and identifier and then you say the type so you have something like this that says that x is an int you literally read it that way var x is an int we also know that how you can create a variable by initializing it with a value and let go derive the type so we can do that okay so that now says that var y is equal to the value 5 and then go is going to infer the type as int what is an array an array is a special type of variable that holds multiple values of the same type. This is gonna make sense with a very contrived example. So before I get into the example, let's call this the world before arrays. Now, here's a contrived example. Imagine that I have five items and I want to keep track of the prices because I wanna do some calculation. I wanna get a total, I wanna get an average price, and so on. Now you might say, well, five items, I can just look at it and pretty much tell. But we're setting up this example to demonstrate the principle. So how might I do that if I don't know to use arrays? So there are my prices for my five item, and I've numbered them from zero, but now I want to do some calculations. So first, let's um, print out all my prices, and then let's do some calculation with it. So let's review our program so far. Nothing terribly fancy. I have my five prices. I print them out. Then I do an addition, a summation of the prices into this total variable. I calculate the average price, and that is, of course, the total divided by the number of items that I have. And of course, I print those out. So let's run our program now. And as we expect, those are our values. They're space separated and the total price. I don't like my average price and I do not like my total price either, how it's formatted. They do not look like prices actually. We know to fix that by introducing a type that we can then attach a method to. So let's do that. And notice introducing a type doesn't have anything to do with an array. I just want my printout for my prices to actually look like prices. I have my type, a new type, I call float64. I should change all my prices here, which are actually float64 values. I should change those now to currency type. Now we have that prices are currency. And if I rerun my program after that simple change, and now everything looks like price and it's formatted properly. Okay, great. So I'm happy with that. But still, this doesn't tell us anything about arrays, except for this really inconvenience that I have here, that I have to call my variable like price zero, price one, price two. And if I were to add another price, because I decided that oh, I have a sixth item, now I have to say price five, currency, and whatever value I want to use. Uh, let's just use some value here. And if I want my calculations to come out correctly, I must add that price five to total. And now when it comes to the average price, I must divide by not five, but six now. And I still want to print that out too. So I have to update a few places. And of course things are going to work now because I adjusted my program to take account for the sixth item. Notice I said sixth item because we're counting from zero. Okay. So how does a array help us? Now this is the world before arrays. So let's see about how do we declare an array. So to declare an array is very simple. We still use var. The array we want to create is called prices. So that still looks the same. And our prices are going to be also currency type. So how do we say this is an array? We use square brackets and a number. And in this case, what I'm saying is prices is an array. When you see the square bracket, if you were keep reading from left to right, var prices, variable prices is an array. When you see the square brackets, an array of six element 
each element being of type currency. And that's the thing with an array. It can contain a number of items of, or values of the same type. You're not allowed to mix type. And that's because you specify the type here. So every element or each value must be of this type. And we can hold six values of type currency in this one variable. And so this gives us the ability to manipulate a number of values using one variable. And let's see how we can do that. Well, first thing first I want to do is print out this variable and see what it looks like, what is inside of it right now. And notice when I run my program, it shows a square bracket and it shows, oh, this is an array. It has number of values and they are each currency. Notice they have the zero value, which is the default value for anything that's not initialized of an integral value. And we know that currency's base value is, or base type is full. So it will have zero. Okay, so already we can see that oh, there's place for us to put our six prices. And so now all we need to figure out is how to store values in an array. And so let me go back and copy this and paste it below here. And so we don't need to create variables anymore, at least not now. So I'll remove this. And that is it. We have used the array name, which is prices. We've used square bracket again, and this is called indexing. So when you use square bracket with the array name, you're saying you're indexing into the array. Essentially, you want to access the element of that array, and the element we want to access is element zero. Now, this is important. Go is a language that's based off of C, C++, and so on. And like C and C++, it uses zero base indexing. Unlike C and C++, however, you cannot use negative number. So anything less than zero is invalid and your program will panic and crash. Not only that, Go has bounce checking. So which means that since our array is declared as having six elements or six places for storing currency, we can say from zero, one, which zero being the first one, because remember you cannot do negative number and it's zero base. So zero is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. If we try to access the sixth element, we'll get an error. And that is good because it means that oh, you cannot write programs that try to store things in memory location that wasn't allocated. This is a common bug in languages like C and C++. No, we don't have to worry about that because Go flags this as being illegal. Compile time error, okay? So this is not allowed, going out of bounds. Let's try and print out our array after we have initialized it and see how things look. And there we are, exact same thing as before. It looks just like this, except these are individual values that we printed out. Here we print out an array, puts the square bracket in front of it to let us know this is an array, and we still have all the same values. So already we see the convenience of being able to use an array. Now we can just use one variable to store a number of values instead of having to deal with a number of different variables. Now, if that was all there is to it, then we're already ahead being able to use a variable to access and store a number of values. But if you look at this, you can see that these numbers, we can use a variable here also to index into our array. So long as the value of the variable is valid, which means it's more than zero, and less than the maximum that you can store in the array. So if our array size is six, then the last index is one less than the length. Well, we can use a variable. So that means now that we can use a for loop. Let's see how we not only iterate, but also access the value for an array. So to access any value from an array, as you can imagine, it looks exactly like how you identify a location to store a value. If I copy and paste what we were doing before, I can write the same code. And now I'm using my array prices. I'm getting the first element of it. Now instead, notice when I put it on the left side and an equal sign, I mean store a value into it. But without assigning anything to it, I'm retrieving the value. So I said get the first value, get the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth, add those up and my result should be the same value as before. And as you can see, it is. What I said earlier is if you look at these values, you can see that 
they're increasing from zero to five. And we know about for loops and we know that we can do a for loop that goes from zero to a value five or the length of the array one less than the length of the array. Let's write a for loop that will iterate over our array or visit each element of our array. So what this does is it iterates, it goes from i equals zero, i less than six, i being less than six means it goes from zero to five, which is good. Now we use an i here to index into our prices array. So now that gets us each value, we assign it to price. But we can't just assign it to price, we have to add it to price. So we're gonna do a plus equal increment, which remember is the exact same thing as if we had said this, right? Those two things are the same. But of course, we already have a value in price, so we need to clear price before we use it here. The reason why we didn't have to do that here is because we're doing the summation on the right-hand side and just assigning the total value. But here, we're looping over our array and assigning each value each time around the loop, so we need to start off with price being zero. We can now bring this down, and the result should be the same. And it is we see that we have the convenience of using a for loop and it's much more compact than using this. Not only that, is if we grow the size of our array, the only thing we need to do is adjust this number here. And even that, there's something for this. Now, what about if we can get the size of the array without having to type it all the time? Here we're remembering it. Yes, we could store it in a constant and reuse the constant, but Go also give us a function that can give us the length of that array. It's called the length function. So let's copy and paste this code. And that's a built-in function. You don't need to import it from anywhere. We're getting this error. And the error here is saying invalid operation. We have length function return an integer, but here we have a currency. We cannot do any calculation, but we know to fix it by casting the integer to a currency value. Now everything is right in the world, and if we rerun our code, this still works. So this is exactly what we expect. We have seen how you can iterate over an array with a for loop using the length function, but it's still even more that Go gives you to make this even easier. Now we're going to look at iterating over a array using the range function or the range operator actually and notice I haven't changed much now I've simply said range over this array and this built-in operator understands how to visit each element of this array and return the index that's why I haven't changed any of the code but just less type in I usually would use the plus equal operator instead of doing it this way but and again we get the same result of course now we've seen how oh, much easier it is we don't even have to use the length function but even when we had to use the length function it was still much better than what we were doing before and still the fun doesn't end here we can still do even more with for loop and the range operator so in this example what I'm going to do is the range operator could return one value. And in this case, when you do a range over an array, it returns the index of that array, but it also can return two values. You can assign not only the index, but also the value. Now you might want to do this because if you want to print out what is the current index and the corresponding value, then you might want to get both index and value from the array. So what I'm doing here is I'm printing the prices variable and the index and then, well, string really. And I'm saying prices of this index is equals to a value. So that's why I is going to go here and V is going to go here. So that's the value. And now you can see what that looks like. In the previous lecture, in lecture 13 for section two, we said that one of the things you can do is use the blank identifier and that allow you to ignore a value when you have multiple assignment. For example, in this case, we can rewrite this loop and we can ignore the index because we do not want the index. Remember, if we don't want the value, we simply don't put it in and the range operator works just fine by returning just the index. But if we want the value, then we must specify both and say that we're gonna ignore the index. And since we're ignoring the index, well, 
we can simply do this. And of course, above here, since we were getting the value already, there's no point in us being explicit because we already have the value V here. So we can just shorten things that way. Not only is iterating over the array easy using the range operator, but also giving you the ability to grow our array wherever we need to initialize it and the rest of this code will work just the same. That works. So one last thing I want to show you before we finish up here in this lecture, and that is how you can initialize an array at the time when you create it. So if we go back here to the initialization of our array. So let's create another array we're going to call prices2. And this is how we did it the first time. And these are our values that we want to initialize the array with. Well, I want to assign the value. So I want to do something similar to something like that. So that is essentially what I wanted. But since this is an array, I must put something on the right side of the equal sign that would allow Go to be able to infer that this is an array of six elements. So the way we do this, if we put equal sign, we still say array six and currency, but now we want to initialize it at the time that we create it. You can remember it's going to be zero otherwise. All I need to do to get my array to be initialized at the time when I create it is enclose the values I want in parentheses and assign it to the array. Of course, I have to precede that array initialization with the type. So here I say I want a six element array of currency and I initialize it. Now, if I do not include six element, that's fine because this says it's a six element array. And even if I leave out some members, guess what? They are just going to be zero. I can call this, put 60 here, for example, and it will still work fine. But I just wanted to show you that you, it's not illegal for you to say that you have a larger array and only initialize it with a few values. And there you go. Take care. See you in the next lecture. Let's take a look at your exercise for this lecture. First thing you're going to do is in this exercise, you have two to do's. To do one is to calculate some stats on the temperature values. And the way you're going to get your temperature values is essentially how I got some values to play with. You're going to call that input get random int number in function and get values between minus 20 and 120. And let's assume those are the temperature range that you care about. Here are some of the things I want you to do with that data. I want you to sort the data, get the max value, the min value, and of course the average temperature. The only other requirement is that your temperature code should be in its own package and call temp. And you'll see that if you look at my main.go, which I give you already, there's a temp.print. So essentially you're going to write a temp package and notice how I import relative to the directory I'm in. So you're going to have a directory here that has your code and you're going to export a function called print, which is going to print out all the things you have computed for to do one. In to do two, we'll put this in its own the solution for to do two in its own package called cart. And in this package, I've already created some code for you. I have a currency that go file and I have a total that go file, which implements this function called get total. Get total simply returns a value that's a currency. And so here's a test of get total. And it's very easy to use. It's just simply called get total and it returns a value. So if I run this, you'll see that it prints out. Uh, where is it? All right, let's go to the solution directory. I stop. To say zero two. Cart go test okay there we go all right so for some reason from my editor it wasn't running so i don't know why but if you run that now you see that oh, it's just returned some currency value so that's fine so that's all that it really does and what i want you to be able to do with that currency value is uh, this is preview but two things so you initialize an array representing uh, total purchases of 20 shoppers. So each shopper has a shopping cart 
and that's the total. When you call get total, it returns you the total for the shopping cart. For each shopper, you're going to calculate a 5% discount and an 8% sales tax. And then, of course, you're going to print the result. Print the results in some meaningful way. I'll show you my example. So first of all, let's go back up and I'll go to solution exercise 02. And let's do go run. And as you can see, let's scroll up. The first thing is this is my data set. This is the sorted data. And of course, my maximum value, minimum value, the sum, and the average temperature. Then for to do two, I decided to print it out in this table to show each shopper ID. Remember, I have 20 shoppers, shopper ID one, shopper one. This is the initial total that I got. This is what happened after I apply a 5% discount. And then this is the final total price they will pay with an 8% sales tax. So you can print this out however you want, just so long as it's meaningful and informative. Now, in terms of how I print this out and the spacing and so on, I put a reference to the code in the solution that this is from the Golang FF FMT package. And all you need to do is go to Golang FMT package and read up on printing and it's going to tell you how to use those width specifiers so this is the section you want to you would like you should read and it explains exactly how you can specify width values okay so that's your exercise welcome to section three array and slices in this section we're going to be talking about how to declare and use arrays in lecture one. In the next lecture, we're going to look at how to use arrays and function. That is how to pass arrays to function and how to return arrays from function and the implication of doing so. Then we're going to talk about slices. Slices are very much like arrays and we can see how we're going to create slices from arrays and these the additional capabilities that slices give you, especially when we get to slices and function, which is be how do you pass slices to function? How do you return slices from function? the implication of doing that. We're going to get into something I call CESC slices at runtime. And all that is, is a mouthful to say that we're going to look at how to create slices, expand slices, shrink slices, and copy slices at runtime. Runtime simply means when your program is running. And finally, we're going to wrap up, and that is going to be tying up any loose end, anything that we left on the floor on purpose while we went through, you know, section one through five, and we're going to pick up those things in the wrap up section. And then, of course, look at the two labs that you're going to have for this section. So with that said, let's jump in and take a look at what arrays are. It's about declaring and using arrays. So if you're new to arrays, we should set the landscape of what we plan planning to learn in this lecture. So in this lecture, we want to understand what is an array. We want to understand how to declare an array and how to store and retrieve values from an array. There wouldn't be any too useful if we can only put values in an array and couldn't get it out, or if all we can do is retrieve values, because then we wouldn't be able to put what we want into an array. We'll then look at how you calculate the length of an array. That can be useful if you do not know the length already. It'd be good to know what is the length of an array. And some of this might not make sense to you why we might be thinking of a length of an array right now, but you will see in a minute. And we'll talk about iterating of an array. Again, which might not make sense to you, but iteration simply means just visiting every element of an array. And if you've never been exposed to array, that still doesn't make any sense, but I want to set the landscape, give you an idea of what we're going to cover before we talk about it. Let's say I had some numbers. And so I have this number 12, and it doesn't really matter what it represents. It could be test score. It could be the number of some particular item in my inventory. And I had 53 to represent yet another number. Again, it could be test scores. It doesn't matter. But I have these numbers, and I have 10 of them. Now, without arrays, if I told you to store these number in your program, you'll have to do is say, these are my values I'm interested in, and I'll have to create a variable to store the first number. And let's say we call that variable x0. And maybe I call it x0 because I like counting from zero. Let's say that for now. And I call the next variable x1, and that stores the value 53. And x2, and it stores the value 86. And x3 stores the value 94, and so on. Now I have 10 variables each with different names. Even though the names are very similar, they have different names because they are storing values for different items, right? Whatever those numbers represent. Well, those are my variables. I have 10 of them. If I wanted to calculate the sum, for example, just a simple thing, that is going to look like 
x0, the variable representing the first value, plus x1, plus, of course, x2, plus x3, and the remaining variables. And as you can see, this is sort of cumbersome. And what if I had a hundred or thousand? Let's say these numbers represent record keeping for the temperature or something over a few years. And I wanted to see what is the average temperature over the past 10 years. And that would be 10 years times 365 day about for per year. And so we're talking about thousands of data points and we couldn't possibly use something like an individual variable for each value. And this already comes with some with just 10. You could imagine twice as many, 20, much less, thousands of them. And so life without an array in that sort of situation is painful to say the least. Here we're going to try and get an illustration of what an array can give you. Logically, you might want to think of an array. So we still have our values and the corresponding variables from the world without arrays because we want to keep that to compare it with a world with arrays. We still have these values, but we want to treat them as one entity. We want to think of some way, if you could think of it as if you had a container that you could put all the numbers in so that you can deal with it as one entity. A very silly way of thinking about it is if I had some balls on the ground and I need to move them from one room to another room, I can certainly take one ball at a time, but it might be better if I just have a bag or a box, throw all the balls in there, and then just take the box to the next room. And now I'm taking the balls with me. So it's sort of like that, right? We want a, a way to encapsulate and think of the set of numbers as an entity by itself. And if we do that, we can call this an array and we can give a name to our array. So in this case, we're gonna call our array nums. Just as a name, we can use anything else. We can start thinking about how do you get to each element or each value in that array. You can see the very first element in that array, we're going to say it's at location zero. And the next one is at location one, the next one is at location two, the next at location three, and so on. We have this one name that we can use to represent all our numbers. We can still pick out individual elements out of that collection, right? So an array is a collection. You might hear people say it's a container. All those things are still valid, right? Now you see that it's important for us to be able to say, well, if someone gives me an array, how do I know how many elements or how many values are in that array? And that's where the length comes in. And Go gives you a built-in function called length. You don't have to import any package or anything to use it. And you can just simply say length of whatever the name of that array. It's a function and it returns the value. And in this case, we have a 10 element array. Another analogy, the way I like to think of it, and I'd like you to consider thinking about arrays is imagine that you had a mailbox and these type of mailbox you'd find in like an apartment building or something like that and you had this mailbox and each little box or storage unit for a customer or apartment owner would get a number and so you would just assign a number to each one of these boxes think of an array like that is the whole big thing is one way of treating everything but then you can also talk about the individual storage unit which are all alike all of the little boxes store values of the same type none of the boxes are bigger than any other box and so on keep that analogy in mind all right my video studio code and of course the section three lecture one declaring and using arrays now let's revisit how we create a variable so far we've learned that if you want to create a variable you simply use the var keyword and identifier and then you say the type so you have something like this that says that x is an int. You literally read it that way, var x is an int. We also know that how you can create a variable by initializing it with a value and let go derive the type. So we can do that, okay? So that now says that var y is equal to the value five and then go is gonna infer the type as int. What is an array? An array is a special type of variable that holds multiple values of the same type. This is gonna make sense with a very contrived example. So before I get into the example, let's call this the world before arrays. Now, here's a contrived example. Imagine that I have five items and I want to keep track of the prices because I want to do some calculation. I want to get a total, I want to get an average price, and so on. Now, you might say, well, five items, I can just look at it and pretty much tell. But we're setting up this example to demonstrate the principle. So how might I do that if I don't know how to use arrays? So there are my prices for my five items. And I've numbered them from zero, but now I want to do some calculations. So first, let's um, print out all my prices, and then let's do some calculation with it. 
but let's review our program so far. Nothing terribly fancy. I have my five prices. I print them out. Then I do an addition, a summation of the prices into this total variable. I calculate the average price. And that is, of course, the total divided by the number of items that I have. And of course, I print those out. So let's run our program now. And as we expect, those are our values. They're space separated and the total price. I don't like my average price and I do not like my total price either, how it's formatted. It do not look like prices actually. We know to fix that by introducing a type that we can then attach a method to. So let's do that. And notice introducing a type doesn't have anything to do with an array. I just want my printout for my prices to actually look like prices. I have my type, a new type I call float64. I should change all my prices here, which are actually float64 values. I should change those now to currency type. Now we have that prices are currency. And if I rerun my program after that simple change, and now everything looks like price and it's formatted properly. Okay, great. So I'm happy with that. But still, this doesn't tell us anything but arrays, except for this really inconvenience that I have here that I have to call my variable like price zero, price one, price two. And if I were to add another price because I decided that oh, I have a sixth item, now I have to say price five, currency, and whatever value I want to use. Uh, let's just use some value here. And if I want my calculations to come out correctly, I must add that price five to total. And now when it comes to the average price, I must divide by not five, but six now. And I still want to print that out too. So I have to update a few places. And of course, things are going to work now because I adjusted my program to take account for the sixth item. Notice I said sixth item because we're counting from zero. Okay. So how does an array help us? Now, this is the world before arrays. So let's see about how do we declare an array. So to declare an array is very simple. We still use var. The array we want to create is called prices. So that still looks the same. And our prices are going to be also currency type. So how do we say this is an array? We use square brackets and a number. And in this case, what I'm saying is prices is an array. When you see the square bracket, if you keep reading from left to right, var prices, variable prices is an array. When you see the square brackets, an array of six element, each element being of type currency. And that's the thing with an array. It can contain a number of items of or values of the same type. You're not allowed to mix type. And that's because you specify the type here. So every element or each value must be of this type. And we can hold six values of type currency in this one variable. And so this gives us the ability to manipulate a number of values using one variable. And let's see how we can do that. Well, first thing first I want to do is print out this variable and see what it looks like, what is inside of it right now. And notice when I run my program, it shows a square bracket and it shows, oh, this is an array. It has number of values and they are each currency. Notice they have the zero value, which is the default value for anything that's not initialized of an integral value. And we know that currency's base value is, or base type is float. So it will have zero. Okay. So already we can see that oh, there's place for us to put our six prices. And so now all we need to figure out is how to store values in an array. And so let me go back and copy this and paste it below here. And so we don't need to create variables anymore, at least not now. So I'll remove this. And that is it. We have used the array name, which is prices. We've used square bracket again, and this is called indexing. So when you use square bracket with the array name, you're saying you're indexing into the array. Essentially, you want to access the element of that array, and the element we want to access is element zero. Now, this is important. Go is a language that's based off of C, C++, and so on. And like C and C++, it uses zero base indexing. Unlike C and C++, however, you cannot use negative number. So anything less than zero 
is invalid and your program will panic and crash. Not only that, Go has bounce check-in, so which means that since our array is declared as having six elements or six places for storing currency, we can say from zero, one, which zero being the first one, because remember you cannot do negative number and it's zero base. So zero is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. If we try to access the sixth element, we'll get an error. And that is good because it means that oh, you cannot write programs that just try to store things in memory location that wasn't allocated. This is a common bug in languages like C and C++. No, we don't have to worry about that because Go flags this as being illegal. Compile time error, okay? So this is not allowed, going out of bounds. Let's try and print out our array after we have initialized it and see how things look. And there we are, exact same thing as before. It looks just like this, except these are individual values that we printed out. Here we print out an array, puts the square bracket in front of it to let us know this is an array, and we still have all the same values. So already we see the convenience of being able to use an array. Now we can just use one variable to store a number of values instead of having to deal with a number of different variables. Now, if that was all there is to it, then we're already ahead being able to use a variable to access and store a number of values. But if you look at this, you can see that these numbers, we can use a variable here also to index into our array. So long as the value of the variable is valid, which means it's more than zero and less than the maximum that you can store in the array. So if our array size is six, then the last index is one less than the length. Well, we can use a variable. So that means now that we can use a for loop. Let's see how we not only iterate, but also access the value for an array. So to access any value from an array, as you can imagine, it looks exactly like how you identify a location to store a value. If I copy and paste what we were doing before, I can write the same code. And now I'm using my array prices. I'm getting the first element of it. Now instead notice when I put it on the left side and an equal sign, I mean store a value into it, but without assigning anything to it, I'm retrieving the value. So I said, get the first value, get the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth, add those up and my result should be the same value as before. And as you can see, it is. What I said earlier is if you look at these values, you can see that they're increasing from zero to five. And we know about for loops, and we know that we can do a for loop that goes from zero to a value five, or the length of the array, one less than the length of the array. Let's write a for loop that would iterate over our array, or visit each element of our array. So what this does is it iterates, it goes from i equals zero, i less than six, i being less than six means it goes from zero to five, which is good. Now we use an i here to index into our prices array. So now that gets us each value, we assign it to price. But we can't just assign it to price, we have to add it to price. So we're gonna do a plus equal increment, which remember is the exact same thing as if we had said this, right? Those two things are the same. But of course, we already have a value in price, so we need to clear price before we use it here. The reason why we didn't have to do that here is because we're doing the summation on the right-hand side and just assigning the total value. But here, we're looping over our array and assigning each value each time around the loop, so we need to start off with price being zero. We can now bring this down, and the result should be the same. And it is we see that we have the convenience of using a for loop and it's much more compact than using this. Not only that, is if we grow the size of our array, the only thing we need to do is adjust this number here. And even that, there's something for this. Now, what about if we can get the size of the array without having to type it all the time? Here we're remembering it. Yes, we could store it in a constant and reuse the constant, but Go also give us a function that can give us the length of that array. It's called the length function. So let's copy and paste this code. And that's a built-in function. You don't need to import it from anywhere. We're getting this error. 
and the error here is saying invalid operation. We have linked function return an integer, but here we have a currency. We cannot do any calculation, but we know to fix it by casting the integer to a currency value. Now everything is right in the world, and if we rerun our code, this still works. So this is exactly what we expect. We have seen how you can iterate over an array with a for loop using the length function. But it's still even more that Go gives you to make this even easier. Now we're going to look at iterating over a array using the range function, or the range operator actually. And notice I haven't changed much now. I've simply said range over this array. And this built-in operator understands how to visit each element of this array and return the index. That's why I haven't changed any of the code. But just let's type in. I usually would use the plus equal operator instead of doing it this way. But And again, we get the same result. Of course, now we've seen how oh, much easier it is. We don't even have to use the length function. But even when we had to use the length function, it was still much better than what we were doing before. And still, the fun doesn't end here. We can still do even more with for loop and the range operator. So in this example, what I'm going to do is the range operator could return one value. And in this case, when you do a range over an array, it returns the index of that array. But it also can return two values. You can assign not only the index, but also the value. Now, you might want to do this because if you want to print out what is the current index and the corresponding value, then you might want to get both index and value from the array. So what I'm doing here is I'm printing the prices variable and the index and then, well, string really. And I'm saying prices of this index is equals to a value. So that's why I is going to go here and V is going to go here. So that's the value. And now you can see what that looks like. In the previous lecture, in lecture 13 for section 2, we said that one of the things you can do is use the blank identifier, and that allow you to ignore a value when you have multiple assignments. For example, in this case, we can rewrite this loop, and we can ignore the index, because we do not want the index. Remember, if we don't want the value, we simply don't put it in, and the range operator works just fine by returning just the index. But if we want a value, then we must specify both and say that we're going to ignore the index. And since we're ignoring the index, well, we can simply do this. And of course, above here, since we were getting the value already, there's no point in us being explicit because we already have the value v here. So we can just shorten things that way. Not only is it written over the array easy using the range operator, but also giving you the ability to grow our array wherever we need to initialize it and the rest of this code will work just the same that works for me. so one last thing i want to show you before we finish up here in this lecture and that is how you can initialize an array at the time when you create it so if we go back here to the initialization of our array so let's create another array we're going to call prices two and this is how we did it the first time. And these are our values that we want to initialize the array with. Well, I want to assign the value. So I want to do something similar to something like that. So that is essentially what I wanted. But since this is an array, I must put something on the right side of the equal sign that would allow Go to be able to infer that this is an array of six elements. So the way we do this, if we put equal sign, we still say array six and currency. But now we want to initialize it at the time that we create it. You can remember it's going to be zero otherwise. All I need to do to get my array to be initialized at the time when I create it is enclose the values I want in parentheses and assign it to the array. Of course, I have to precede that array initialization with the type. So here I say I want a six element array of currency and I initialize it. Now, if I do not include six element, that's fine because this says it's a six element array. And even if I leave out some members, guess what? They're just going to be zero. I can call this, put 60 here, for example, and it will still work fine.
But I just wanted to show you that you, it's not illegal for you to say that you have a larger array and only initialize it with a few values. And there you go. Take care. See you in the next lecture. So in terms of your exercise for this week, if we bring back up our navigation bar and we look at the stub or description, if you look at your exercise for this week, it looks very similar and it's actually taken from exercise one, which is to declare an array of 10 to 20 elements of type float and use a constant to declare that array size. So that remains the same. The only thing you're going to do differently now, create a slice or initialize a slice from that array. For this exercise, once you initialize the slice, that is the only purpose of using the array in this exercise. You will not use that array name again. From that point forward, you use the slice to store some random number and also to calculate some total max and so on. If someone doesn't show you whether a variable was declared as a slice or an array, you would not be able to tell from this usage which one it is. This exercise should be literally copy and paste and modifying about two or three lines. So if you have problems, of course, you can take a look at my solution. Welcome to lecture four in section three, slices and functions. Our objective in this lecture is to understand how slices and functions work together. We will be looking at passing slices to functions as parameter and how to return slices from functions. Additionally, we'll compare arrays and slices in the context of function to see what are the differences, which one may be better to use. Finally, we will revisit variadic functions. We covered variadic functions in section two, lecture nine. So where do we start? I don't have any code yet, but that's because I want to reuse some code we've already written. So I'll use the code that we wrote in lecture two, section three. And that is because it's going to be very similar to the code that I want to develop in lecture four anyway. So we might as well start off with code that we've already written. I'll close this and of course, give us some more room and update a few things. And instead of doing arrays, we're doing slices. As you can see, arrays and functions, slices and function, very similar name. Of course, that's when I want to use it. Okay, so we know how to declare a slice already. In this piece of code, I have a type called data set, which is defined to be an array of a certain size for, of ints. I'll still keep my cons data set size, but I want my data set type to just be the type defining a slice. So we know that, oh, the way you declare a slice is by simply square bracket and the type it's gonna store. So that's our slice. So now data set is just a slice. What this means is data is a slice and it's a nil slice. Note that once we create a slice variable, we do not have an underlying array. So the slice cannot store any data and it's nil. It doesn't point to an array. So it is invalid to try and store data into that slice. And we can try storing some data and we'll see that it will crash, right? If we now try to run the code. Okay, and you can see index out of bound. That is because we do not have a valid slice, it's nil. But I do need a slice on which I can work because my for loop here tries to store some data into this slice. So let's do what we've done before and create an array which we'll initialize our slice with. So, okay, so now our data slice is it properly initialized with an underlying array and now this piece of code should work. So let's run it and see. And notice how everything works the same simply by changing our type from an array to a slice. We did not have to change anything else. And we saw this before in the previous lecture, when we look at slices, we saw that those slices behave exactly like arrays, except that you have this ability to have multiple slices into an array. So we shouldn't be surprised that just changing our data type to a slice that everything else should work. It just looks like an array to all the code that we have already written. So what is the benefit then? Like this is really surprising. We didn't have a lot to do. So first of all, let's compare this code with the previous code. So I'll right click this and say select to compare. I'll go here and then compare with selective. And if I close this off and scroll down, as you can see, nothing else changed. The only thing we did was create an array, sliced it and store it into data. 
and of course change the type of our data set. That's it. Two changes is all we did and our code still worked the same. So let me close this and go back to the code. So, okay, so this is easy, but what now? Now we know how to pass slices to functions and return slices from functions. Well, we're doing exactly that here. But the question is, do we really need to return a slice? Because so far, it looked exactly the same. When we did not return a slice from our sort function, we did not modify the underlying array because we were passing a copy of the array. So let's remove the return value here. And we we're going to say that we don't need to return a slice and see if this works. And since we don't have s data as a value that's returned from sort, we can rerun our code. And notice how our code still works, even though we do not return a slice. So this is telling us something. When we pass data to our sort function, a copy of that slice is made. But that's just yet another slice pointing to the same array. Because why? The slice itself has some metadata. It says, which array am I using? Where is the start and offset? and how long it is. The interesting thing here, or the important thing rather, is that now since we make a copy of that information, that information still has the same metadata, which is I'm pointing to this array, this is my length, this is my start. So since it's pointing to the same array, it didn't copy the array, but rather just copy that metadata. And so within our source function, we have access to that array. And so that's why we manipulate that same array that the slice was pointed to was passed to a sort, and we don't have to actually return it. This has important consequence for manipulating a large set of data. Sure, it's more efficient, but remember, since you're using slices, you're manipulating the underlying array. So if there's a need in your program to keep a copy of that original data unmodified, then you'd want to copy it first, and that's what we're going to cover in the next lecture. But for now, at least we see that the big advantage of using slices is that when you pass a slice parameter to a function or you return a slice parameter from a function, you don't have to do or incur the cost of copying or duplicating the data. And this is significant when you're using large data sizes. The other advantage of using a slice is if you remember when we were using arrays, our type encodes how long that array should be. In this example, I am passing half of the array, or it doesn't really matter if it's half or not, but just a fraction of that array, I have sliced it and stored it in data, store some value in it, and now passing it to the same min and sort function. So now we can rerun the code and it works just fine with either the full array or half as much. And you can imagine that it would work just as well with a much larger data set. And so now I've created a slice of a very large array. I'll spend some time initializing it, but notice again, I don't have to worry about rewriting another min or mac or sort function for this different size data. It will still work whether it's less or more. Now I don't want to print it out because it's quite a bit of data and I do not want to print out the sorted data either, but instead let's print the min and maybe a fraction of the sorted data. And there we go. And we, of course, we can change our range to be a little bit more interesting. So as you can see, this seems to work just fine. It takes some time. That's because we're basically talking about 100,000 integers that we have to sort. But at least we know when we pass those 100,000 integers to our sort function, they're not being copied. And our function can return without having to make yet another copy. So far, we've seen that passing slices to function better than and more efficient memory wise and would be faster to pass a large array as a slice to a function to be worked on. You save on memory, you save on time spent doing the copying. Returning a large set of data from a function, best to do it with a slice. So we've seen those two things. And so when we compare slices to array, we can see that using a slice is much better than using array. And unless you have really, really good reason to use array, always prefer to use slices. Even if you're given an array, just slice it and write your algorithms and function to work on slices because then it can be amended very easily and be reused without any change in code, whatever, to that algorithm if you have a larger data set. So always try to prefer slices. 
I said one of the other things that we're going to look back at in this lecture was variadic functions. Let's write a function which is going to do addition, basically sum. Essentially, what I've written is just a simple function called sum, and it takes zero or more in value. So these are some of the ways we can call sum. So of course, we can call sum without any parameter whatsoever, and we should expect it to return zero. We could call it with one parameter, and since there's nothing else to sum it with, it of course should return that. And we could call it with a few more parameters. If we run this now, because we haven't written anything really, we should get zero for all our values. Uh, you know what? I'll remove the sort call here because it's going to take a little time every time we run our code, and I don't want to deal with that hit, and I don't want to see. 20, well, I guess I could see 20 zero value. That shouldn't take any time to print out, but let's do this again. And we can see it there. So our output, again, just zero. Well, before we can understand how we should really access the values for V, let's print out what type V is. So let's rerun our code now. And look at that. So V is a slice of int. Even though we declare it as a variadic parameter, the parameter to sum is not a slice. I know this because if I try to call sum with a slice, it will complain. So we already have a slice data. If we try to just pass a few of those values to our sum, it will not work. It will complain. Just five, it doesn't matter. Five or 10, it doesn't matter. As you'll see that we cannot use data slice 10 as a value to our argument to sum because there's two different things. So we cannot pass this slice to sum. We'll revisit this line, but for now I'll comment it. But inside the function, this is how Go is allowing us to access those many values that we get. So since this is a slice, we know that though we can just iterate over it. So now we can properly implement our sum. So since we do not want the index, we can ignore that. And that is all it calls for us to implement our sum. By now you understand how for loop range and slices work, that you should be convinced that how this code will work. And so I'll remove this because we don't need that. And let's rerun our code. And there you go. That is the value we should expect, 0, 5. And if we go through and look at summing up those value, it comes out to nine. So this seems to work. The question is, can we still use a slice of value or even an array and pass it to a function that expects variadic parameters? In other words, can we expand those individual array values so that they look as if we are calling the function with the individual values? So one way you might imagine calling sum is to say this and so on. And for our example above, essentially we want to keep going until we get data of nine. So is there a shorthand for this instead of doing this? And the answer is yes. I call it the expand operator. And essentially what you do is if you want to pass slice to a function that expect variadic parameter is you put an ellipsis after the value. And it basically says expand those into individual values. So again, you can imagine that Go, behind the scenes, is just doing some gymnastics for us, a little bit of a shortcut. And notice now I do not have any warning or errors, and I can rerun my code. Having variadic parameters and now knowing slices and array, we can not only consume them within our function, because the variadic parameter is going to be given to us as a slice, but now if we have slices and array and we want to pass them to a function that expects variadic parameters, we can also use it. So let's try this example again, this time with an array. And so we haven't seen this way of declaring an array, but essentially, based on the number of elements I specify in my initializer, you use that as the length of the array. So this is the exact same thing as if I said, I want a four element array of int. And if I have another value, this is the exact same thing as if I put five in this place. Let's pass that array to our sum function. And as you can see, it fails. And that is because we cannot take an array and expand it. We can only take a slice and expand it. So this works like that. 
So we can take an array, but we have to slice it first. Hopefully this makes sense. Um, definitely play with it if you don't get it yet, or it seems confusing. Play with it a little bit, write some more examples, play around with the code, and make sure that you understand what is happening. If you want to confirm that this is indeed an array and not a slice, of course, that's very easy to do. And we can see it says array of five integers. So that is an array. Okay, that's it. Take care. See you in the next lecture. Bye. Let's take a look at your exercise. And so your exercise for four is essentially the same thing as what you did for arrays. The only difference is now you create an array of a few thousand elements. So remember that though we're talking about temperature ranges from minus 20 to 120. So just imagine that you have maybe 10 years of data or something like that that you've collected daily. And so we have a few thousand ints that we want to find the minimum temperature, the maximum temperature, and so on. And so you'll use that array of a few thousand ints and initialize a slice from it. But you will not use the array once you created the slice. Once you have the slice, now you use the slice to initialize that underlying array. It's very, very simple. I hopefully when we did our example where we only changed the type, you saw that we didn't have to change any of the code. And that's only to really drive home the point that arrays and slices pretty much work the same way. There's some other things that you can do to your code now that you know that how you're using a slice. And that is when it comes to sorting the value, you know that you do not need to return a slice. Hi, welcome to lecture five in section three. And in this lecture, we'll be looking at how to create slices at runtime, how to expand them, grow them, in other words, how to copy them. And we'll see when we say copy, we meet something slightly different than just assigning and how to shrink slices. Before we look at the code though, I want us to have an idea of what we'll be looking at in detail. So like I said, we're looking at creating slices at runtime. So far, the way we have created slices is from an existing array. I will see why this is sort of limited because it means that you always have to have an array first before you can work with slices. Look at expanding and growing slices, how to copy them, and finally, how to shrink slices. Before we get into the code, however, let's have an idea of what we mean when we say creating slices at runtime. So let's say we declare a variable s as a slice. We know that in order for it to be useful, it needs an underlying array. For the moment, I'm ignoring and not showing all the offsets and all this other stuff because you know that already, so keep that in mind. So the question is, can we get an anonymous array to which our slice s points to without us first having to create that array. That's why it's anonymous because we don't know where the array is. We don't know the name of it. All we know is there's an array that we want for our slice because we want a usable slice and we know it must have an array. In terms of copying, there are two ideas to keep in mind. If we have a slice S, let's say for now we initialize it from an array and we say we're going to point this slice to some array. Again, leaving the details of where it's pointed to and how big it is and so on. Now, if we do a S2 is equals to S1, we know that what we're really saying is that S2 points to the exact same array and of course to the same window and the same number of elements and all this other stuff because S2 and S1 are equal, but they point to the exact same array. And this is what allows us to use slices as parameters to function and return them from function, knowing very well that the array itself will not be copied, but rather only the metadata that points to this array. And we exploit that benefit to say that oh, we can pass really large arrays to a function to be operated on by simply passing a slice to that array. However, when we talk about deep copying a slice, we can imagine that we have a slice S1. And if we say we want a deep copy, what we want is that slice one, while it points to its own array, when we make a deep copy to slice two, slice two should point to its own array. So we should make a copy of the arrays. So we do not want the default behavior of slices where they reuse the array. We actually want the array to be copied. Keep in mind this idea of a shallow copy versus a deep copy. So now that we've covered, at least in theory, some of the things we want, let's jump into code and take a look. So what I have here is a, a simple Go language program. And this is our lecture five in section three. I'll close it off the Explorer so we have some code. 
and we're looking at creating, expanding, copying, and shrimping slices. So the first thing to do is to say, let's create a slice variable and print it out. And you should expect that length is zero and the type is int slice. And that is exactly what we get, an empty array because our slice is nil, but Golang and the print function is smart enough to know that the type of it is a slice. So even though it's not pointing to a valid array, we can say that it's empty. Let's now initialize this slice from an array. And now we have created a slice from an array and save it in S0. And of course, if we rerun this, since our array we're pointing to has 10 elements, the thing that we're looking at though in this lecture is how do we create a slice that has a valid array without us first having to create an array. So let's imagine that we had a function that made and return a slice. We know that how we can return slices. So let's write a function that actually take a number and return a slice. Okay, so I'm cheating a little bit. I pass the size that we want here, even though my function actually said 10, but maybe I don't really want to specify how big the arrays is in the function name. So I would like to ideally pass the size in and have the function make array of that size, slice it and return it. Well, there's a problem. When I'm creating an array, I can only use constant. I cannot use a variable. So this is not allowed. I'll get an error. It tells you how this length needs to be a constant. So obviously having a function that takes a variable as the size of the array to create is not going to work. So I really do need to pass the size. And if I'm going to pass the size in the name of the function, or at least hint at it, I really don't need to pass any parameter. And so now I can say, well, my function make slice 10 of int can do this. And now I can sort of create a slice S1. and no error so far so let's run this and look at that they're both the same i can prove to you that we're getting a new slice every time because what i'll do is i'll modify an element in slice one and then repeat the same thing i will see that our two slices are different the values are different for each one of the slices but this seemed cumbersome and not too scalable because every time I want a slice of a certain size, I'll have to write a function for that slice. So if now I imagine that I want a slice of 20 elements or even five, then I have to write a function that can just create an array of five, slice it and return it. So I'll remove this piece of code because we know that all the slices are all different. So I will need to keep that. So now I have this other slice, but now I want this to be a slice of five int and of course, if I run this, we should expect this to work also. And it works. So what is going on? Why am I going through this? I'm trying to show that if I wanted to create slices dynamically, I could sort of do it right in my own function that return a slice. Fortunately for us, we don't need to do that. Go is taking care of this for us. Go has what's called a built-in function called make. And so we can simply call make and we don't have to implement it. We can simply call make and tell it the type of slice that we want to create. So in this case, I want a slice of int. And how many elements I want? Let's say 10. Here, I want a slice of int again, and maybe I want five. Here, I want, let's say, a slice of currency. Well, I don't have the currency type yet, but let's create that, a type called currency, and I can create a slice of that type also. And maybe I want seven of those. And let's store a value. Well, maybe we can store a value. Okay, so I'm simply using multiple assignment. And now if I rerun our code, there you go. I have created slices of the different types. Slice of main that currency saying that oh, this type was defined in the main package. But notice the make function can make any of the slices and it could do something that I couldn't do, which was to create an anonymous array with a size that I give it dynamically. So the make is a built-in function say make a slice we know that it's pointing to an anonymous array and we can use it so far what we've just done is create slices at runtime using the make function that takes care of creating slices at runtime the other thing we want to understand is how do we expand slices how do we add values to it one of the things that we have with an array is that the size is fixed so once you create an array of 10 or whatever 
you cannot add any more element to that array. If you create an array of 10 elements and at runtime you realize that you do have one more element you'd like to store on an 11th element, well, sorry, no place to put it in that array. However, slices are not as inflexible as array. Even though they are backed up or the underlying storage for a slice is an array, we can see because it's anonymous, we can actually swap it out. And let's take a look at that now. No surprise here from what we have seen before. What if we wanted to append a value to this slice that currently does not have any underlying storage? Keep that in mind, no underlying storage, but I still want to grow it anyway. So I'll use the append function, which is a built-in function, just like the make function and the length function. Let's grow slice four by adding a string value. What I've done is said, use the append function to append the string value to slice four. Now, if you think about it for a minute, if we have slices and we need to append them, sometimes it might mean changing or swapping out the underlying array. In this case, our slice four does not have an underlying array. So if we happen to change it or add to grow it for whatever reason in order for us to accommodate adding values to it, we will lose access to that new slice that was created. So for that reason, when you use the append function, the usage is always gonna look something like this. After we have appended to it, let's print out the value and the length. And notice, at first our slice was empty, the length was zero. Now our slice is no longer empty and the length is one. When we created our slice, it did not have storage, but now it does. So let's append yet another value to our slice and print it out. And of course, we should expect that we now have two values after this call to append and the length of our slice should be two. And that's exactly what we have. We have New York, Chicago as values in our slice and the length of our slice is two. Now, if you look at the signature of the append function, you'll see that oh, it actually takes more than one value. We can see this if we copy this. And there we go. It says it takes a slice of some type and any number of values. Those are variadic values. And it, of course, return a slice of that same type. That tells us that we can pass more than one string value. And now let's run our code and see the result. And as you can see, our slice has grown to accommodate the multiple values we have provided. So now we know how to expand slices. The next thing we want to look at is how to copy slices. And for that, you can imagine that if we have a slice, let's say we want to copy it to S5, this is a shallow copy. And we know it's a shallow copy because we can modify values using S5 and it would still modify the same array that S4 points to. So let's take a look. And let's modify a value using S5. I should modify it first before I try printing it out. And as you can see, both S4 and S5 are pointing to the same arrow. So this is a shallow copy. This is not what we mean when we say we want to do a copy of a slice because we know this is how it works already. So this is not what we want. We want to see how to do deep copy. So I start off now, I will make a slice called S6 and it can only hold three string values. Now I want to make a copy from S4 to S6. So S6 is my destination. And if you look at the signature of the copy function, you'll see it says destination slice and then the source slice. There are no return values. So that's S6 and S5, for example, or S4, it doesn't really matter. And so what is the expectation? At this point, what we know will happen is that we expect some of the values from S5 to be copied to S6. Now, since the length of S5 is five, what happens since S6 is only three? Will it grow S6 to make room for the additional values from S5? Well, let's run it and see. And as you can see, no, it did not. So we can see is if your destination is less than the source, well, it only copy as much as can be stored in the destination. And this works the other way too. If your destination is larger, well, then it only copy as much elements from the source. So we can try that also. And now we'll make a slice that is larger than the source, which we'll call 
say, seven elements. And of course, we should only expect that five elements should be copied into our slice and the remainder elements should be empty. And since we don't actually have a way to see empty strings, maybe we should put something in there to show it. And what we should expect is because this is at offset four and we're saying that our source slice S5 has five elements, I should expect LO to be overwritten, but the fifth and sixth element shouldn't be overwritten. And as you can see, that is exactly what happened. We overwritten the first five elements, but the one that says world and nice, those are not overwritten. So no problem if your source or destination have different sizes. Of course, the key thing to note here is that we had to create that destination slice first before we call a copy function. The copy function did not create storage for us like our append function would do. Now, notice how we were able to grow a slice from nil, an empty slice. It works the same way if our slice already has values. As you can see, when our slice already has values, we can still append to it. So I showed you the extreme of starting with an empty slice and growing it. When we try to assign to an empty slice, we had an exception, an out of bounds error. But our append function tests that the slice that we're trying to append the value in, if it's empty, it just simply grows it. So that's why we do not have out of bounds when we try to add a first element to a slice that's empty. Because we know that append will create a slice for us if we have a nil slice, we can actually use that to make a copy of a slice without first having to create a slice. So let's see if we can create a slice that's the same length as slice seven without having to do make slice first. So how might we do that? We want a copy of all the elements in slice seven, but we do not have enough space in slice eight to store those values. We know this, so let's run it. And copy was smart enough to say, well, that's nil, there's no place, it's empty. There's no place to copy the element from seven. And so just like it wouldn't overflow, same reason if it's empty, it wouldn't copy any values. So how then can we get all the elements of seven into eight without first having to make a slice that has underlying storage? We can use the append function. And our append function takes variadic parameter, it doesn't take a slice, but we already know that if we have a slice and we expand it from our previous lecture, we can now pass those values from the slice to a variadic function. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna expand the values from slice seven and pass in the nil slice eight, we know that append will create enough storage and return it. And there you go. So slice eight now is a true copy of seven and it was a short end to be able to use this because then it just saves us the extra step of saying, make a slice of some size. So this is another way in which we can have a deep copy using the side effect of the append function ability to create storage for us. So now let's talk about shrinking. So to be truthful about it, Go doesn't have any way of actually shrinking a slice. And think about what it really means to shrink a slice. If you have a slice and you want to shrink it or an area you want to shrink, well, we've been using copy and specifying the sort of where we want to copy from. Well, one of the things that we haven't covered yet what we'll see now is that you can re-slice a slice. So for example, here I have slice seven and eight, which are like copies of each other. They have how many? Seven elements. Let's say I wanted to shrink that. Well, I can create a shorter slice, of course, a window into that underlying array by re-slicing a slice. And if I want to do a copy, well, we know how to do that. So first let's create a window into the underlying anonymous array using a slice. So maybe I do not want these first two values, but I want Charlotte and San Francisco. That represent offset one and a length of two. So let's slice that slice into that. So offset one, so zero, one, actually two, because I don't want zero and one, but I want from Charlotte. And the length is two, so two plus two is four. So that's all I'll specify that. And let's print it out and see if we get what we expect. And there you go. Slice nine points to the exact same array as slice eight, that anonymous array. It's an anonymous array, but we were able to re-slice slice eight to get a new slice. So not only can you slice an array, but you can re-slice a slice. 
But now, slice 9 actually points to the same array as slice 8. So if we modify slice 9 or the elements of slice 9, in other words, it will modify the elements that slice 8 points to. What if we wanted to create a new array that is just a part of slice 8? Well, we know how to slice a slice, so we can simply use this side effect from the append function that we used earlier to have a smaller array. So slice 10, and let's say we wanted to just have those two elements from slice 9, or maybe some different elements. We can do slice 8. And now I'm saying I want maybe from 4 to the end of that array. Let's do it that way. And that's a slice. Remember, I re-slice a slice. And now I expand it using the expand operator. And since 10 is empty, the append function will just create a nanobus array copy those values into it, and then return a new slice for me. That's essentially shrinking that slice, but I don't shrink the original slice. Remember, you cannot modify an array. The size of an array cannot change once it's created. And when we have slices, that's what we're doing. We're still using arrays. The only difference is whether we create that slice from an existing array we create, or we use the make function to create an anonymous array, but it's still an array. We can never change the size of that underlying array. We can change the view of it by reslicing that size, which is what we did for slice nine, or we can create a new slice based off a slice of that array using the append function or even copy function. So we could have used copy if we had said slice 10 is equals to make, and you know, we actually make a big enough array. And then of course we can use copy. So you have all these different ways in which you can create a new either view with a slice or a new slice with its own storage represent part of the original slice, either use an append or copy. Keep in mind, all of this just simply means that you cannot change the length of an array, but you can get around it using the combination of append and copy. If this doesn't make sense to you, rewatch the video, check out the reading assignment, and try the exercise. Let's take a look at what's available for reading assignment. I have already pointed you to the language specification on slice type and slice expression. Today, I am adding making slices and maps and channels. The make function can make these three things, but since we haven't covered maps and channels yet, once you read the material on make, just sort of sticks to the examples of slices and ignore anything that mentioned map and channel. The other thing is the append and copy function. You can read that part of it in the language specification also. And if you haven't yet, definitely check out Go Slices Usage and Internal from the GoLang blog. Okay, that's it for this lecture. Take care. See you in the next and final lecture for this section. Let's take a look at what your exercise is for this week. So for this week's exercise, what you will do is you will implement your own copy function. If you think that a copy function is hard to implement, give it a try, think about it, write it down on paper, and then think about how you might implement it. If you still can't get it, of course, look at the solution, but that's what you need to do. You just implement a function called my copy string slice, and basically this is the type it works on. And I have already written some code to test your copy function. The function is called test my copy string slice, and it will exercise your copy function. Here's the code for test my copy function, and it's at the bottom here and you don't need to really worry about it. Once you run it, it's going to check and see if your copy function returns the correct value. The next to do you have is to implement your own append function. If you think about how append work based on just playing with it and seeing how we're able to grow things with append, to test that your append function work, I create a slice variable s, that's nil, I call your append function to append a string value. If your append function is implemented correctly, I should get back a new slice that has an array link suitable to store this value with this value stored. And if it works correctly, I should be able to call it with these variadic parameters and have it return the appropriate slice. And if I print that out, now I should have this as my printout value. This is gonna allow you to get comfortable with using append and copy if you can try and implement it. That's it for your exercise. Let's start by taking a look at lab exercise. So in this lab, you will implement a function to correctly reverse the characters in a string. And here are some example string and what they look like when they're reversed, if you put an input. 
you don't have to worry about writing the test function because I've written that for you here. So with this test function, I want you to just come and click on run. If test one was, if I give it hello world, I get back this. Test two, I give it hello world in Chinese and it gets back that. And notice how there's some Spanish and these accented characters and they have to be reversed also. The other thing I would recommend as a tip is to use pen and paper and just draw out on paper what logically you think an array look like or area strings and then try to imagine if you had to reverse it, what would that look like? Don't go for clever, just go for something that works. Let's take a look at lab exercise two. In lab exercise two, your task is to compute the letter grade for its set of test scores. And so the program will start out by prompting the user to enter how many test scores they have. If they enter zero, the program exit, no problem. However, if they enter a number greater than zero, you have to prompt them repeatedly to enter the test scores. Test scores in this case, I said they're just integers. Once you get all the test scores, what you need to do is calculate the average test score and then print out a letter grade. Exercise three is gonna be built on exercise two essentially. Instead of prompting a student to enter all the scores, what you'll do instead is accept as your program argument four parameters. The first is gonna be the number of students in a class and must be greater than zero. If it's not, then you should print an error message and tell the user why, and the program should exit, allowing them to rerun the program. The second parameter should be the number of exam per term, and the fourth and final parameter is the name of the class. The next thing you wanna do is generate some random test score for each student. Remember, they would have told you each student, how many exam per student. So now you have an idea of how many test scores you need to generate, and you can use input that get ran int. And of course, you're gonna generate some random numbers, which are gonna represent test score for the students. The minimum possible value on a test, we're gonna say is 30. So that should be pretty straightforward for to do one. Once you can get that and print it out, now you want to print things out nicely. And here, you're gonna print a report. Your report should include the class name, which was entered as a parameter to the function, and for each student, their test score, and of course, the letter grade. And then for each test, you wanna print the average score for that test. Let's take a look at my solution and see what that looks like. Let's say I wanna do 10 students per class, maximum of three exam, and math score is 100. And this is a math class, for example. And I run this and you can see student one, these are the test scores they got for the three exams, test one, test two, test three and their letter grade at the end. So you don't have to print it out exactly like this, but it must have the class and letter grade per student. So certain things must be there, the average score. So that gives you an idea of somewhat what the result should be for lab 03. Let's move on to lab four, fourth and final lab for section three. In this lab, you're gonna be using the program arguments. So for example, you'll call your program, let's say my underscore at, or pretty much anything, but you probably keep it simple. And you'll be able to pass three parameters. Notice these are three parameters to your program. First parameter, second parameter, and your third and final parameter to your program. What this represent? It's always gonna be now plus, and then this is where the user is gonna specify how long they want to wait. So what is the at program? The at program, and I put a link to it here. You can go look at examples on the internet, or if you're on a Linux slash Unix machine, you can test it. We want to write a simplified at program or simplified at program, which we'll call my at, for example, allows to say something like my at now plus two seconds, which means two seconds from now. And the format of duration is from the go line times package. Okay. So definitely look up the documentation. I put a link here to it. And so let me give you an example of how you run this program and what it look like. And notice I provide some hints of which set of functions you can use. So let's say I was to run my program. And so I compile it by saying install minus O and I give it a name or you can use build. I get my program name. And now I can say my at now plus two seconds. And it means that oh, I want to be reminded or I want the message that I'll print two seconds from now. So let's run that and see. So there's my at. And one of the things I can do is just simply say go build because I have it in a directory called my at. Golang is going to give it the name my at. 
and so now I can run it. So if I type my at and just run it like this, it gives me some useful help. That's not part of your requirement, but feel free to add some help if you like. However, if I run it with the first example, which is now plus, and let's say I did not put the third required parameter, notice how I get an error. So if I don't give you enough parameters, I get an error. So plus, and let's say two seconds from now, and now it prompts me for the message, and I say, and once you enter, you wait, notice two seconds later, it prints out my message. And this can be used for anything. So I can say, for example, not only five seconds, but I can say two hours, 30 seconds, and two milliseconds if I wanted to. I don't want to wait that long. And if you look at the Golang documentation for the times package, you can see that you can specify any number of things. You can even specify addition of time duration. Keep it simple. Of course, you type in this and want to wait. So here you see an example of two minutes. Here is one hour. That is what your my ad application is supposed to do. It's combining the ability of taking parameters, parsing it, making sure it's valid, and then using some of the things we know already, like if statement and so on, and combining that with your knowledge of using packages and being able to go look up the documentation for a package and use it.